Okay. I should have known that would happen. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. My name is Fraser Christie, and I'm so excited to connect with you as we explore some of the animals of Rocky Mountain National Park. So, friends, before we jump in, I just want to double check and see if you guys have just something to draw on. It can even be a whiteboard. If not, maybe just a piece of paper or a scratch piece of paper. And if you have like colored, um, like pencils or crayons, that would be awesome too. Because at the end of our time together, we're going to do some drawing, okay? This is part of our exploration. And I saw Easton ran away, so we'll give him a second to, to run back. I see our other ladies are getting their stuff together as well. <laughs> Excellent. And then Haley, I just want to double check in with you. If we do have some verbal questions, will these guys be able to unmute themselves and answer if we want to do some of that? They should be able to, yes. And if okay. uh, if I see that they're, they're having trouble, I'll, I'll try and help. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So when we let everybody scramble here for a second, <laughs> it's totally fine. Yeah, you don't have to necessarily set yourself up just yet, but just have it nearby you for in a little bit, okay? So ladies, are you guys all set? Do you have everything that you need so you can give me? Sweet, awesome. All right, we'll just let it for Easton to run on back. <laughs> and then for my three ladies, can you guys raise your hand? Have you ever been up to Rocky Mountain National Park before? Have you been up and visited? So one of us, sweet, awesome. Well, that'll be a good adventure maybe this summer for, for your other friends as well, to be able to come up. For my friend that had raised their hand and has been up before, if you want to unmute and share, do you remember what you did when you came up to the national park? Did you go on a hike? Did you camp? Did you go fishing? Anything like that? So, Ethan, you got everything you need now? Thumbs up? Okay, so you say yes. Okay, wonderful, awesome. So I, again, I'm Ranger Christie. I'm super excited to hang out with you all today. If you're feeling brave, there will be some times where I try to ask you guys some questions and you can try to unmute yourselves and answer out loud. Since it is just a small group of us today, it can be kind of fun to have that, that conversation back and forth together. So I always think that's really fun. So I am a national park ranger at Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, just up the hill from all of you. So I am just up the road to the west um, from Loveland in Northern Colorado here in Rocky Mountain. So Today is really beautiful out. I'm sure it's similar in Loveland today, um, but probably not quite as warm. So it's a nice like 70 degrees today in Estes Park. So always a good reason to come escape up to the mountains and go for a hike and to go exploring today. So we always know that we're in a national park versus say one of our really cool state parks that we have in Colorado or a city parks whenever we see this logo. So this logo represents all the things that our national parks across the country are preserving or protecting and taking care of. And it's actually so important that you'll see it on our signs when you drive into the national park and we even wear it on our clothes as well. So friends at home, using your eyes, what do you see in this arrowhead or in this logo? What do you think it stands for that we are preserving or protecting? And if you wanna share, you can, you can just raise your hand and then I'll call on you. What do you see? Easton, can you unmute yourself and share with me? What do you see? Oh, Easton, your video went away, friend. What'd you do? Oh, there we go. I'm a, I'm a, a mountain buffalo trees and, and a, like a scenery. Yeah, awesome, excellent. So let's start with that mountain. So if everyone can go ahead and take their hands like this and wave them at me. Excellent. We're gonna put those over our eyes. We're gonna go like this and look around and say, oh, the beautiful scenery, right? So that mountain represents all the gorgeous scenery that we have in our national parks. Of course, here in Colorado, we certainly have mountains, but it could also include things like um, the Grand Canyon, for example. So gorgeous scenery that we're preserving and protecting across the country. We also mentioned this big old tree. So let's go ahead and get a little like this. You guys all get little with me. And then we're gonna wiggle our way out of the dirt and the ground. We're gonna grow up big and tall and spread our branches out. 
act like a big sequoia tree there. And so that sequoia tree in our logo just means all of the different plant life that we're preserving and protecting in our national parks. Excellent. We mentioned the bison down here on the bottom. So let's take our fingers like this and put them on our heads. This is great because I can see all your faces. So can you give me your best grumpy bison face? Because they don't really like being around people. I don't know if you guys have seen these before. You know, we have some in Northern Colorado. But we'd have to go maybe to Yellowstone, for example, to see some in our national parks. So that bison is all the different cool animal life that we're preserving and protecting, which is of course what we're gonna explore today here in just a little bit. And then we also have two things left. So this little lake here represents our clean, fresh air and the clean, fresh water in our national parks, but also all the fun stuff that we like to do in them. So I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I'm brave enough to actually swim in these cold lakes that we have in the mountains. So can you guys swim with me for a second? So maybe you swim like this, or maybe you're a, a swimmer like this, whatever your style is. <laughs> it's the clean, fresh water and what we like to do in it. And then lastly, this outside shape the arrowhead shape of our logo represents all of the human stories that we're protecting. So we'll take our thumbs like this, put them in front of our bodies, and we'll point to ourselves, and we're going to preserve and protect our history. So our history that we're protecting inside our national parks. Excellent. So Rocky Mountain National Park is just one of the many that we can go and visit. Um, and so it's awesome that we do have some friends here today that haven't been up the hill before to come see this place because we're going to go on a very special flyover to see Rocky Mountain National Park and start thinking about what it takes for animals to be able to survive here. But in order to do that, I need you all to put on your explorer caps with me. Can I see you put them on? Thank you. And we're going to buckle them up under our chin because riding in helicopters is dangerous business. Then we're going to go ahead and start our flyover into Rocky Mountain National Park. Excellent. So Rocky Mountain National Park was set aside or protected in 1915, so over 100 years ago, to preserve and protect and take care of these high elevation ecosystems and habitats of the Southern Rocky Mountains. So if you come up here, you'll see everything from those low green lush meadows, all the way to the rocky tops of the mountains. So as we're flying up and over, if you pick out that tallest peak, it's one that you all can see in Loveland as well. That's Long's Peak at over 14,000 feet tall. Who can raise their hand if they'd be brave enough to try to climb that mountain someday? Anybody, Easton? Yeah, awesome. <laughs> so a few of us. And as we fly down from the tops of our mountains here, we are seeing a lot of our pine forests and that clean, fresh water that we mentioned earlier. So a lot of that water in our lakes in the Rocky Mountains comes from the melting snow that we still have on the tops of the mountains even yesterday and today. So who would be brave enough maybe to, to jump in some of those cold lakes sometime? Yeah, some days it sounds really good, right, when it's like 90 degrees outside. <laughs> But as we keep flying over, I want you to be thinking about what animals might live or survive here in our national park. Excellent. So as we go forward today, we're gonna to be thinking about the animals that call Rocky Mountain National Park home in terms of their adaptations. So being that many of you guys um, have already probably studied in this in school, does anyone want to take a shot at defining this word for me? If you do, go ahead and raise your hand and I can call on you. How would you define that word to somebody? Do any of my ladies have an idea? You guys want to take a guess? They're like, maybe, maybe. Easton, did you have an idea? How would you define that word? Mm. That's okay. All right. So I have a really quick, easy way for us to remember it if it helps. So, friends, wherever you're at, if you want to stand up with me so we can get some wiggles out. So, let's go ahead and stand on up next to your chairs. Excellent, excellent. See, we're all making moves here. Wonderful. Great. So, we're going to start with our arms by our sides. And I'm going to have you do what I do back to me, okay? So we'll go adaptations <laughs> are something on your body, something inside your body, 
or something that your body does <laughs> to help you survive. I want to see everyone's big, strong arms. Excellent. Okay, so let's do that together a little bit faster this time. We'll put our hands by our sides. <laughs> that was a good one, you said. <laughs> We're going to go adaptations or something on your body, something inside of your body, or something that your body does to help you survive. Let's see all those big, strong arms. Excellent. So when we look at our different animals that live here in Rocky Mountain National Park and think about what they need to survive, we might see things on their bodies or inside their bodies that we can learn about or things that they're doing to help them. So as I play you this next video of some of our animals that live here, maybe start to see if you can pick out some of those adaptations of these different animals. All right, so our first friend here in our video I think it's catching up to us slowly, is a pika. Can you guys raise your hand if you've ever seen a pika before? Anyone? Oh yeah, super cool, right? We're so lucky to live in Colorado with pika. They live on the tops of the mountains. And then we also have these big old animals that uh, Miss Haley had a chance to see one recently. Both of these, the moose and the bear, that live in Rocky Mountain National Park and elsewhere in Colorado as well. So our bears, especially this time of year, we're thinking about them a lot in terms of how we can protect them just by making sure we always take care of our garbage and that we lock our cars at night so that they can't get any of our human food supports. And our next animal is sneaking quietly through the meadow as it hunts around, looking for something to eat, usually going undetected by most of us, other than maybe finding its scat that it leaves behind or some bones that it leaves behind. And that is our mountain lion that's hunting for maybe one of these animals, like a big elk that we also have, you know, down in Loveland and many of them up here in Rocky Mountain National Park as well. So some cool adaptations that they're working on growing back right now are the antlers on the tops of their heads. If you've seen any recently, they're still fuzzy as they're eating and eating those nutrients <laughs> and getting ready for summertime. So as we go forward, we explore these adaptations of our different animals today, we're gonna play a little bit of a game. So in this game, when I show you a picture, if you think that the animal is a baby, like this little baby elk here, I want you to rock your arms like this. Can everybody show me those? Excellent. And if you think that the animal is a parent, I want you to put your hands way up, up above your head and wave them around because you're so busy. You got so much to do, right? <laughs> All of our adults do. All right. So let's test that game out on our first picture here. What do you guys think? Is this a baby or is it a parent? Oh, excellent. I'm seeing many, many waving arms. It is indeed a parent elk. So what are some clues that you use to decide that this was a parent? Would anyone like to unmute and share? I think I'm a, I'm a, it, it has ant, antlers and, and um, babies he's, he's don't have, have antlers. Perfect, Easton, right? So can you guys all show me your elk antlers on the tops of your head? Hey, so if we see antlers or horns on animals, it's a pretty good sign that it's going to be an adult, right? There's not babies running around yet with antlers on the tops of their heads. So a great clue here on our elk that it was indeed a parent. Did anyone else have any other clues that they used to help guess on this one? Ooh, yeah, go ahead, ladies. Go ahead and unmute. And would you share your name? I don't know who's Prince in this room, but. Okay. Um, I'm Nessa. Addie's back here, and this is Jenna. Okay. And, yeah, and I think another clue is that it's bigger than a baby would be. Great, right? The size of an animal can be a really big help. So it's good we all kind of have an idea in our mind of how big a bush like this is, right? Like maybe it would be up to like my waist in real life if I was standing next to it. So this animal is much, much larger than even a bush. So size is also a really great clue. So we'll keep using those clues as we play more rounds of our game. So friends, what do you think on this one? Is this going to be a baby or is it a parent? Show me with your body. Right, no fool on you guys. Little naked it is indeed a baby. Did anyone use any other clues to help them on this one? 
It's small and pink, no. I think. So it's small, it's pink. And this no fur. Pink. Oh, and no fur, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Nessa, do you guys want to unmute and share? I was gonna say it was small and pink. Small and pink. Did anyone else notice that it still had its eyes closed? Mm, yeah, so that could be kind of another clue, right? Some animals and babies will have their eyes closed for a little while when they're first born. So does anyone want to take a guess at what kind of animal this is? Does anyone have any ideas? Nessa, go ahead. Yeah, I was actually going to guess. Oh, go ahead. I think my guess is that it's a bear. Ooh, that is, I can see that with the little ears. I'll give you a clue. In real life, it would fit in my hand when it's a grown-up. Oh, I know what it is now. Is it a rabbit? Close. We're getting closer. Here, I'll, I'll reveal it to you. This a is mole. A oh. <laughs> so this is a baby squirrel. So certainly when they're babies, like we saw in the nest, they are teeny, teeny, tiny, right? Can we all picture what the size of a squirrel would normally look like? So that baby, if I could have it with me here today, it would fit probably in the palm of my hand. So super teeny little. So they really need to rely on their parents to get a lot of things that they need to be able to survive. But it won't take very long for our squirrel to grow up to have all the adaptations that it needs on its body to survive. So let's take our hands and we're going to pretend that we have squirrel hands now. Because if we look at our photo of our squirrel up close, you can see that it has little tiny fingers that help it to pull apart pine cones. So everyone grab your imaginary pine cone. I want you to pull apart your pine cone as you start looking for all of those seeds that you need to be able to fill your belly. So collecting all these pine cones and pulling them apart, and you know, you can maybe eat a little bit if you'd like, if you're getting kind of hungry like me, right? It's a whole lot of work for a squirrel to be able to do this. So our squirrels sometimes will do something else really special with their body to help protect their food source. So let's have a listen. Ooh, raise your hand. Has anyone ever heard a squirrel make that noise before? Yeah, so maybe you've been hiking down a trail or walked close to a tree sometime, but they'll make that sound to try to say, please don't go near my refrigerator, right? They worked really hard to fill it up with all these pine cones. And I would like if you go find your own food. We're of course not eating pine cones, but they don't know any different. <laughs> so the squirrels, they will do something else really special to help build up that pine cone stack. So as we watch this one next to us, see if you can notice what it's doing. And I know it's going a little bumpy for me as well, but does anyone have an idea yet of maybe what this little squirrel's doing? Nessa, I can't. Nessa, Addie, and I forgot our third friend's name. Try it. Jenna. Jenna. <laughs> Go ahead. What do you guys think it was doing? I think it was stuffing its cheek with something. Perfect, right? So it's stuffing its cheeks. So in this video, it's stuffing its cheeks with maybe materials that would have helped it to, to build a nest. But sometimes they'll do it to be able to carry their food back to so can everyone make their very best squirrel cheeks for me? I can't do it very long because that almost makes me want to fall over, right? So the squirrels, they don't have backpacks like we do to carry their stuff around. So they have to use parts of their body. They're adapted to do that to be able to carry their food back, maybe feed their babies or maybe even build their own pile to be able to eat all winter long. So it's a lot of work being a squirrel. And our squirrels, why do you guys think they're a brown color? What might that help them to do? Who has any ideas about that? Go ahead, Nessa. I think it would help them camouflage. Yeah, camouflage with what? With nature. Anything in particular in nature that you were thinking um, of? Maybe like trees. Perfect, right? Like if you're a squirrel, you're gonna spend a lot of your life on a tree, being brown would help you to be able to camouflage in. So we want to hold on to some of those nuggets because later I'm going to ask you guys to um, design an animal with some of these adaptations as well. Okay, excellent. So our squirrel, we learned, loves to spend its time in the tree. I think I should. All kinds of cool adaptations. Oh, there. 
on its body to be able to survive. So this next animal also likes time in the forest. What do we think, friends? Do we have a baby or do we have a parrot here? Show me with your bodies. Yeah, we're waving our arms high above the sky. Indeed, this is a parrot. So what clues did we use this time to decide that we had a parrot black bear here? Does anyone want to share? Easton, did you have any ideas you want to share this time? Um, I think um, um, it, it looks older. Oh. Cool. And um, the fur it has, like it has more fur than babies. And and I think by the size the size of the pine cone owns it. It's not small. It's like bigger. Perfect. So oh, you see in that picture, yeah. Yeah, I love that. You were using clues in the photo as well, right? The size of the pine cone, how much mm -hmm. fur that it has. That is excellent. Yeah. So we'll play this game a few more rounds. So friends, I promise you, you'll get a chance to share again. So great, so all wonderful clues for our mm -hmm. black bear. So our black bear, the first photo that we saw, it was kind of a cinnamon brown color, right? But it's still a black bear. And then some can even be dark colors as well. So some scientists who study bears think that it's because they like to kind of blend in with the shadows, right? They won't want to stick out. So they're not really blending in perfectly with the tree, but they just want to be hiding in places to keep themselves safe. So that would be true as well for even our baby black bear that you can see already has lots of fur on its body. So another place that bears like to hide sometimes can actually be up in trees. And they have all these really special adaptations on their body to be able to do that. So friends, can we take our squirrel hands and turn them into bear paws this time? Excellent. So I'd like you to imagine, and if you want to get up again, you can jump up and get down low. And we're gonna go ahead and climb a tree together. So I'll see you guys up at the top, okay? Are we there yet? Oh, I see some of you getting up top. So I wanted to share with you all today a black bear claw that fell off. So look at my human finger compared to the size of one of these claws that a black bear has on the end of its paws. So you can imagine if I had these on my fingernails, I would be a much better tree climber because I could grip onto the tree and climb up, eh, maybe not fast, but as quickly as I would want to. Excellent. All right, so who has any ideas about why a bear would want to be up in a tree? Why would, why would a bear want to do that? Jenna? Tide. Oh, sorry, Ethan. I think, I think it'd want to be up there. Sorry, I think it got muted midway. Can you try that again? Unmute yourself. There we go. I think it would want to be in a tree to like find berries or honey and that's in the tree for food. Absolutely, right. finding food, right? When I think about bears, right, they're sleeping a lot and they're always hungry. They're always looking for food to be able to fill their bellies. So black bears, now that you all have made it to the top of the tree, can you take your paws and just go ahead and fill your bellies? We're just gonna fill our bellies. Maybe there's some up high that you need to get a hold of. Because a bear's job all summer is to just keep eating and eating and eating and getting nice and fat so that it can survive the winter time, right? So when we don't have all these beautiful berries or lush plants for our bears to eat in the winter time, right? When it's super snowy in Colorado, our black bears have to take a nice long nap. So they put their paws under their heads. And they go to sleep and they live off of all of that fat they've stored up during the summer months. So they do that really special hibernation. And that's one of those special adaptations that happens inside its body that we can't actually see. So super cool how our black bears are being able to survive here in Colorado and elsewhere in other states as well. So our first two animals spent most of their time in the trees, but our third animal eventually will spend most of its life up above the ground. So what do you guys think? Do we have a baby or do we have a parent here? Mm, yes, I see many, many little rockabies. Absolutely, this is indeed a little baby bird. Would anyone like to raise their hand? And I can call on you to share 
how you do. Ooh, maybe our friends that are logged in on Shana's iPad. Would you like to unmute and try to share? Go ahead, you know how to do that? It's a flamingo. <laughs> it's close. It's a bird. Not quite a flamingo. How did you know that it was a baby, though? I saw you wrapping your arms. Mm. How did you know it was a baby? Because they're tiny. Perfect. It's they were small. little, right? Mm, they're very little. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, Easton, you want to unmute? How could you tell that it was a baby? Um, uh, I think by the fully or this does that small size and and um I'm a uh, compared I think to the nest the baby needs since they're smaller like like the nest and the smaller. Perfect, Ethan. I love how you look at the clues around the animal too to help you out. So it's in a nest, right? It's small and in a nest. Nessa, what were you guys thinking about? I was thinking it, it was a baby because it has white fur. Oh, right? I don't know what you guys, but there's not many like white fur things running around in the woods in Colorado. Not many. There's a few in the wintertime, but not often. So yeah, what its body is covered in can oftentimes be a really good clue. So these are baby red-tailed hawks. They have white little fuzzy feathers on them and they can't yet actually go find their own food. So they're starting to grow in the feathers that will help them to be able to fly someday. But for now, they still have to rely on their parents to get their food. So baby birds, they have to beg. So if you guys can go ahead and turn your little hands into little beaks for me and make your very best little bird chirp to yourself. And they have to beg and ask for food. And I think you guys did such a great job that I see mom flying in to drop off some food to the nest to you. Excellent. So our red-tailed hawks, one of the wonderful adaptations that they have to be able to survive are these really big wings. But there's something really special about the red-tailed hawk's wings. If we look at the upside of them, the side that goes towards the sun, they're brown, but the underside is white. Hmm, okay, so when it's flying around, it's showing a white side to the ground. Does anyone have any ideas about why the bottom of its wing might be white? Any brainstorms about that? Hmm, Easton, what do you think? I think it blends in with the sky and the clouds. Perfect, absolutely, right? So if you're a little mouse or a rabbit running around on the ground, you, as a red-tailed hawk, don't want to be eaten, right? So you're always maybe looking up to the sky, trying to see what's coming to try yeah. to eat you. So the red-tailed hawk's wings help it to actually camouflage with the sky up above. So something else to consider and think about for later when we design our animal. Excellent, wonderful. Okay, does anyone else see any other adaptations on our red-tailed hawk? Anything else you notice? Nessa? Well, I noticed that it looks a little brownish, so it might be able to blend in with, with brown stuff. Where would a red-tailed hawk blend in with brown stuff? Where might it be? What were you thinking about? Uh, I was thinking more like brown trees or something. Yeah, so maybe when it's not actually out hunting, and flying around, it wants to be able to sit in the tree undetected. That's awesome. Wonderful. And then Shayna's girls, I think you guys had an idea. Did you see anything else? What do you, what do you want to say? Um, I want to say um, the birds have flat wings. <laughs> yeah, big, big flat wings. So can we all put our big wings out and soar around for a minute? So those big wings are super important as that red-tailed red hawk flies around in the sky and it looks for food. But another really special adaptation that it has on its body are its eyes. So can everyone show me your red-tailed hawk eyes? So imagine flying hundreds of feet up above the ground with your big wings, and then using those eyes to be able to spot food down below. So really special adaptations on our red-tailed hawk to be able to survive. 
So our last animal that we're going to discover today is one that does actually run around all the time in white feathers. Well, part of the year. So friends, what do you think? Is this one here, is this bird going to be a parent or do you think it's a baby? Mm, no, this one might be harder. That's okay. So just do your best guess. <laughs> Easton, you're so close, but this one is actually just going to be a big parent, but it's, it's babies do look a lot like that. Okay, so this is a white-tailed ptarmigan. We have them living up all the way on the tops of our mountains here in Rocky Mountain National Park. And our ptarmigan, kind of their superpower, is that ability to always camouflage in with their surroundings. So friends, point at your eyes if you can even find the ptarmigan in that top picture. I know from where I'm standing right now, it's really hard for me to be able to see it. <laughs> Can you see it? Yeah. So it is perfectly camouflaged in. I'll kind of point to it. Where my hand is at, it's right behind my hand if that helps you find it. Okay, so in the summertime, it's perfectly camouflaged in, and then in the wintertime, it's perfectly camouflaged in with its surroundings as well. So in the winter, it looks like snow, and in the summertime, it looks just like a rock. I bet I've walked by many of them and haven't even known it. So camouflage for the ptarmigan is definitely super duper important. So our ptarmigan also have something else really special on their bodies, which is on their feet. So friends, can you raise your hand? What do you notice about the feet of a ptarmigan? What do you see? Let's go to Nessa and your friend. What do you guys see? I see that their feet are look really furry. Really furry. Okay, so when we think about birds, though, what are birds covered in? What do birds have on their body? Birds don't have fur. But what do feathers. 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 Perfect, right? So it's actually feathers that are on their feet. So can anyone think of why you would want to have feathers on your feet? I don't know. Have you seen many birds in your life that has feathers on their feet? Not many, I'm sure. Easton, what do you think? Um, uh, I think it ain't to not, not, I'm um, a uh, feel the cold snow. Perfect, right? So for a bird that lives up high on the tops of the mountains in Colorado all winter long, and it blends in with its surroundings, being able to stay warm is going to be super important. So having feathers on your feet helps you to stay warm. It also does something else. Have any of you guys ever been snowshoeing before? You've gone up to the mountains and snowshoed in the snow? Mm. So we put these big things on our feet that help us to stay on top of the snow so we don't sink in. So the ptarmigan basically turns its feet into big snowshoes as well. So all kinds of cool adaptations on its body. And then if we look at one of the little babies up close, they're born this time of year, right? In the summer months when they need to look like rocks. So they come and they're born and they look just like little baby rocks <laughs> running around up on the tundra. Excellent. So we looked at a couple different examples of interesting camouflage and the number of cool adaptations that animals have to be able to survive here in Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado as well. So what we're going to do next is I want you to think about some of those different adaptations. And remember, they can be things that we see on their body, like feathers or fur. It could be cool stuff that happens in their body. So use your imagination, or it could be something that it's doing, right? Like making a sound, carrying things in its mouth, like a squirrel, that are going to help them to survive. And what I want us to do is to actually design an animal to live here in Colorado that either has camouflage or has some sort of adaptation. So you're going to, the sky is the limit here. You can think of whatever you would like to do. So this is where we're going to use our paper and our colored pencils or whatever you've got going on, okay? So I'm gonna give us a full five minutes to be able to do this. And on my next slide, I have five different pictures of animals and they all count down a minute. So that you can kind of use to time yourself a little bit, okay? So an animal is gonna disappear every minute. So I'm gonna draw on an animal. I'm gonna have you guys start designing your animals as well. So if you wanna grab your materials, we'll get started. Oh, this is always so hard. So go ahead and get started. You can start working on your animal. Design any animal that you want. 
All right, friends, that's your one minute warning. One minute left. Final detail. Alrighty. So wherever you're at is fine. You can always finish your picture later, but I'm going to share mine first to be brave. 
and then we'll have you guys share yours. So if you look at my picture of Rocky Mountain National Park, <laughs> I have my trees. Oh, it's funny. It's picking up my green screen on my tree. That's hilarious. And I have my mountains. So I drew the tree for scale to show you that this is a bat that's the size of a moose. <laughs> and so it's flying around and it's eating all the mosquitoes because the mosquitoes are starting to come out in the mountains so that it can eat lots and lots of bugs so we don't have to be squatting at mosquitoes here in the park. So it has the adaptation of being very large and flying kind of like the wings. Um, and it has it's dark brown, so it camouflages in with the night. Excellent. Okay, who is brave and would like to share their photo in their camera for us? Let's start with Easton and then Nessa will go to you guys next, okay? So Easton, you wanna hold yours up in the camera and show us? And unmute yourself, buddy, so we, you can explain it to us too. I am actually added two animals, like an owl, like near its nest and like in a tree and he, he ended like go rattlesnake, make that like blends in with the surrounding. Perfect. So your snake would be maybe like the color of rocks, kind of like the ptarmigan was the bird, the last bird we saw. Yeah. Yeah. That. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. All right, Nessa, let's go to you guys. So then we'll have you guys each go if you want to. So I did a big horn sheep. So he's down here. Perfect. And then I got some wind up here and then some sun, a sun and some clouds. So what would your bighorn sheep have uh, to be able to survive? What would help it survive? Um, it's hiding in dead stuff. Cool. Very cool. And okay. it's horns. Right. It has those good horns to help it survive as well. Excellent. All right. Does anyone else, do any of your other friends want to go? Mine is a, mine's the red-tailed hawk. Cool. And its adaptation is like blending in the sky like a cloud. Awesome. So you drew that white underside of its wings. Excellent. Thank you, Abby. I have a bunny hiding from a fox because it's the same color as the ground. Ooh, okay. So it's using its camouflage to blend in as well to stay safe. Excellent. Thank you, ladies. All right, and then Shayna, let's see. Did you guys do some drawings as well? Go ahead, Sophia. Um, I drew a bear, see, some stripes, those are fur. I draw a bear, it's right up here, a bear. This little stripes, that's the fur. So it's covered in fur to help it stay warm, maybe? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Yep, go ahead. A unicorn. <laughs> what does your unicorn have on it that's super special? Oh, I forgot to what they have blue skin. <laughs> it's called fur. Molly, do it later. So it has fur on it too? Yeah. Awesome. I was thinking that its horn was really special, right? Yeah, we have the right. animals that have two antlers or two big horns, right? Like our big horn sheep, but we don't have many that have one horn on its head. So thank you so much. Awesome. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for drawing with me and exploring the adaptations of our baby animals and our parent animals that live here in Rocky Mountain National Park and that they use those adaptations to be able to survive here, but also everywhere, right? So when you guys go out and about next time, maybe you're going on a walk in Loveland or somewhere in the foothills, like be looking for these animals and thinking about what it takes for them to be able to survive. So thank you so much. I loved your drawings. Um, I'm glad that you were all brave enough to share with me as well. Does anyone have any questions for me before we sign off and go eat lunch? If not, that's totally okay. Yeah.
Oh. Yeah. Can you your question again? Um, so about my bear is, if my bear has fur, then why does, if a bear has a tail, maybe the fur will be gone because mm -hmm. the tail will just have fur? Even baby bears, when they're born, are pretty furry. So I don't think I've ever seen any that don't have any fur. But I like how you're thinking about like its tail could help to keep it kind of warm too. Mm -hmm. But imagine, yeah, if a bear lives somewhere really hot, it probably wouldn't want to have all that fur on its body. So that's why it's perfectly able to survive here where it's really cold in the mountains as well. Good idea. All right. Nessa, you guys want to go? I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you and bye. <laughs> thank you. You're very welcome. All right, everyone. Have a great lunch. Bye. See you the park soon. Thank, thank you, Miss Ranger Christie. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.